communication is a, a big topic, but one of the NLP presuppositions is that the meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you consider that, that the meaning of communication is the response you get, if you're not getting the response you want from the person you're communicating with, the ownership shifts back to you to alter how you communicate. Often, we just blame the other person and say, well, they just don't get it. They're too stupid. You know, I wonder why I didn't get the budget. You know, we never like think maybe I should have explained this in a different way. So I did get the budget or so they did understand. And this is that's a problem I had in my company. Uh, my staff would say the clients just don't understand what we're talking about. I'm like, <laughs> they're not in cybersecurity. They're, they're a doctor's office, for instance. We need to articulate in a way that they do understand it. Otherwise, why are, we, why are I even in business, right? My, my staff, my, my clients need to understand it so they can improve their security. You see yourself as the smartest person in the room. The real truth is that most effective leaders don't actually see themselves as the smartest in the room because they are too busy seeing and appreciating the value of the rest of the people in the room. However, the trick in leading great teams to successful outcomes is often how well you can leverage your team or your company's smartest minds to the benefit of all involved. It's a skill as well as an art, and my guest today wrote the book on how to do this. His name is Christian Espinoza. He's an entrepreneur, thought leader and author, and an experienced business leader who is passionate about inspiring others to harness their own wisdom and find the courage to tread new paths. He has built successful businesses in cybersecurity and elsewhere and has some pretty extreme hobbies too, from Ironman triathlons to climbing two of the famous seven summits and skydiving and all sorts. His book, The Smartest Person in the Room, shows you how to get the best from your team's brightest minds to your benefit and theirs. And today we'll be hearing about Christian's career and management experiences, lessons learned from his businesses along the way, and exploring his take on leadership, cybersecurity, and life in no particular order. So stick around for an entertaining, enlightening, and educational chat. Welcome to the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Christian, welcome to Leading with Integrity. Great to have you here today. Thank you for getting up so early to join us as well. Yeah, not a problem. Happy to be here. Well, happy to have you. And we're going to dive straight in, really, and hand the mic over to you to introduce yourself. Tell the listeners a bit about your career history, your career so far, uh, your background, if you like, as well, what you do today and why you do it. All right. So a little bit about my background. I uh, grew up in extreme poverty in Arkansas. It's a, a state in the U.S. Uh, known for being impoverished and not very populated. Um, and I, I sought early on uh, stability and safety uh, in my childhood, because I didn't have that growing up. It was very chaotic. Uh, my mother was addicted to pain meds, and there's always cops and accidents and arrests and things going on. So I, I sought that safety and stability and, and ended up applying to all the military academies. And I went to the Air Force Academy, which gave me that safety and stability that I thought I wanted. And then I only lasted about six years active duty. I, I didn't really like being told what to do all the time. And I worked as a defense contractor for a while. And then I worked in the commercial sector and then I quit a job without having another, another job lined up. And I realized when I first started my entrepreneur journey, I did a solopreneur for a while that that safety and stability I thought I needed as a child really wasn't in alignment with my personality. I, I preferred to take risk <clears throat> and start my own business and grow my own business. I felt more aligned with that. And it just took me a while to unravel 
that seeking safety and stability because I thought that's what I needed because I didn't have it. But I realized after I achieved that with a nine to five and, you know, a decent salary and a white picket fence and, a, and then a house with a mortgage that that's not really what I wanted. So, yeah, I'm on my second cybersecurity business now. I sold the first one and I'm growing this one, Blue Goat Cyber, hopefully a lot smarter than the last one. I've paid the dumb tax with the last business and I hopefully I don't pay as much dumb tax with this one, as I say. The dumb tax. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I paid a lot of it, unfortunately. <laughs> well, you know, it's part of the journey. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's that's a good thing in a lot of respects, though, isn't it? Because it means, you, you know, you've paid your dues and... You can learn from those mistakes, and yeah, I would think we've all we've all probably paid quite a bit of that tax yeah. <laughs> over our careers, haven't we? Um, so interesting. So in the Air Force, then some pretty exciting experiences in there, I imagine. And then I know you're also into extreme sports as well. So I feel like you've got quite a different kind of varied CV, if you like. How did you go from all of that into cybersecurity? What what's the what joins the dots, if anything? Yeah, it's interesting. I went to the Air Force Academy to fly jets. I saw the movie Top Gun, which is one of my favorite movies. Top Gun Maverick is awesome as well. And I heard they're coming out with the Top Gun 3 soon. I saw that movie and I know it's Navy, but uh, I didn't want to live on an aircraft carrier. So I thought I'll join the Air Force and fly jets in the Air Force. And then two years before I graduated, they started cutting all the pilot slots. So I would have had to wait you know, with a backlog for a while before I even got into pilot training. So I ended up becoming a communications officer. My degree was engineering. So I worked in communications in the Air Force. And then in the Air Force, you do a lot of in communications, like protecting classified data and stuff, which is cybersecurity. We just didn't call it cybersecurity back then. So I used that as a launching platform to go into the commercial sector in cybersecurity. Okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yes, Top Gun has a lot to answer for, doesn't it? Funnily enough, I was interviewing a retired Navy pilot, and he was he was telling the same stories because obviously, when you meet a Navy pilot, you have to ask, like, "Is Top Gun real?" Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the answer was yes and no to, to simplify it. But uh, yeah, he did say most. He, he refused to put a number on it, but he reckoned there was a pretty high percentage of all the pilots he's met in his career were pilots because of Top Gun. <laughs> it's like the best, uh, I think, Navy recruiting movie unintentionally know, right? that they came out with. And it, it caused me a lot of anxiety because I was, you know, I'm a big Top Gun fan. And they kept postponing Maverick because of COVID. They wanted to mm -hmm. have it live in the theater. So I get, I get all amped up to see it. And then they postponed it again because they didn't, you know, they weren't opening enough theaters. So I finally, finally saw it in the theater. Um when it came out in San Francisco and then I saw it again in Hawaii. Uh, then I've seen it, you know, a few times as well, uh, just streaming. So yeah, it was, it was cool. Yeah. Yeah. You've mentioned the dreaded C word there as well. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, COVID has a lot to answer for, doesn't it? I mean, on that subject in the cybersecurity world, the, the COVID years, everything shifted online. I mean, did that have a big impact on cybersecurity generally? Did, was it something that people were a lot more worried about as a result or? Did it not really have an impact? Well, it had a big impact on my first business because we did in-person cybersecurity training. Oh. And of course, when you can, can no longer hold in-person training, that line of business uh, kind of went away, <laughs> which which provided some stress for my business. And then, yes, it uh, did op open up a lot of vulnerabilities because my company was used to working remotely. We had procedures, but most companies were not. So they had to quickly figure out what the security vulnerabilities are. And it could be even, it could, it's even things like in the background of a Zoom meeting, people could have a whiteboard with like customer names on it or a password and things like that that a lot of people didn't think about. Or when you share a screen, people were sharing the entire screen and they might share something sensitive. So it's stuff like that that I had already worked out in my first company that the rest of the world hadn't quite figured out. Because I think I was probably one of the first people to start using Zoom before Zoom really blew up because of COVID. Yeah, it's funny with Zoom, isn't it, in particular, and the, the others that kind of followed on from it. People talk about it as though it's only been around for a couple of years, but <laughs> right. it really hasn't. It's just nobody wanted to use it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like my first company, we, we, we had an office, but I, we didn't, I didn't make people go to the office. We all worked remotely and had meetings via Zoom, and we'd go to the office every now and then, but 
like I said, it's a, it's a growth process to get us to be mature. And I'm, and, I, and I'm focused on cybersecurity. And even, you know, what data is on somebody's laptop is a challenge too. So like with my company, all of our laptops had full disk encryption. So if the laptop was stolen, somebody couldn't get sensitive data off the laptop. And I think a lot of people didn't really consider that when COVID first happened, which opened up like we said, a lot of those vulnerabilities. Plus you have shared laptops. You have shared devices where your family members can log on to your device. And sometimes your family members in the background and you're having a a meeting, but they didn't sign a non-disclosure agreement with your company. So people just think, well, that's my my wife or whatever, but they're not part of the company technically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the... A lot of companies, especially small businesses, they wouldn't have been providing laptops or, or computers to their workers. They were probably expecting people to use their own from home. And that that has to be a huge vulnerability, doesn't it? That's a huge vulnerability because some people don't may not have a laptop. They may be trying to use a tablet or their telephone, and they mm. may share the password of that computer with their children, which download all kinds of stuff. And a lot of people didn't have an office. So they're like working in the living room where everybody can hear them. And, you know, this is a distraction as well. So it was definitely a lot of, a lot of challenges for sure. Indeed. And if you could pick one, I don't know if you can, this might be too difficult, but what would you say is, has been the defining moment of your career, at least so far? There's been a lot of defining moments. I think one of the biggest ones, which set me on my entrepreneurial journey was I was a VP working for a commercial company. I was doing penetration testing and overseeing projects with aircraft. Uh, So that was kind of cool. But I was having a a consistent run-in with the CEO. And it it was causing me like so much mental stress that I just decided to quit that job without having another job lined up. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I craved stability and safety. That's like my driving thing. In this moment, the stress got too much where I was like, you know, screw it. I don't need stability and safety. I'm just going to quit. I'd never done something like that before. I'd never quit a job without having an, another one already figured out. And when, when after I quit, I just felt like this wash of relief, like, okay, I don't have to deal with this anymore. And I took a little, a little while to figure out what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, at this point in my career, I've got a pretty big network. I've got a decent skill set. So why don't I try to do freelance work? And just, you know, work for myself, basically. So I did that for about six years and I got bored with it. Uh, I was making a lot of money traveling the world. And I just thought that I'm not growing is what I I kind of felt like with the freelance work. I'd stopped growing. So I thought the next thing to do would be to start a business and hire people and figure that out, which will force me to grow, force me to become a better leader. And... I'll be somebody contributing to the economy and to the development of other people at a bigger level. Cause it won't just be me as a solopreneur. It's, it's a team of people in my company. So yeah, that, that moment where you, sometimes we think in hindsight, you know, it it was a blessing in disguise and that's really what it was that all that stress, but I quit and that put me on the path I'm on today. I have to say that that part of it is a a familiar story. Uh, Not just cause I did that myself as well. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> very similar you know biting heads with some unnamed individuals quit a job without having one to go to didn't really know what to do next and ended up kind of working for myself and then start starting a, a company of one as well but I, I hear it from a lot of solopreneurs in particular as well that so many people hit that point where they've just for whatever reason i'm done being an employee now mm. i've had enough of the bosses i don't like the stress i don't like the hours I prefer the flexibility, all of those kind of different factors. And again, you know, going back to COVID, uh, I mean, a lot now has been written about that sort of wave of people doing that and the great resignation and things like that, all all resulting from it in a way. Yeah, I'm not sure I quite understand this great resignation people talk about because I I feel like a lot of the people that sort of resigned, I don't don't know what they're doing. (laughs) I'm not sure they actually you know, became a, a solopreneur or anything, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I just, I sense a lot of people just quit working and I'm not sure what they're doing for the great resignation. Cause it's, we, we seem to have a lot of shortages for, uh, for, you know, employees on a, a number of fronts, even in, even in cybersecurity, they talk about the skills gap, which I think is largely BS. I put an ad 
on LinkedIn for a penetration tester. And I think in like 10 hours, I had 109 applic- applicants. And, and, and this is an industry that's saying there's, you can't find any talent. You know, I, I had no problem finding talent. And we, but so I don't understand where we talk about the skills gap thing about we need three more million people in cybersecurity. It's not not true from my perspective. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think they all went off and started their own companies or became freelancers. I think they probably left the employers that perhaps weren't valuing them adequately and, and have moved industry, perhaps. I mean, certainly a lot of the, the industries that got hit worst by COVID, um, yeah. things like hospitality, for example, you know, workers have left that industry and they're not coming back because why would they if it happens again? They know they're going to be treated badly. They know the money's not worth it. They know that their jobs will disappear if, if COVID hits again or something or the next thing, whatever it ends up being. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily they've just gone out on their own. I'm sure some of them have, but I said yeah. it's all of them. But you're right. I mean, it's interesting. It's one of those things, isn't it, where what we read about it may not necessarily reflect the truth. Yeah, I, I, I do know several people because uh, I, I traveled a lot during COVID. I would go over to the UK and to Ireland quite a bit and Europe, which was a whole another set of challenges with with travel and the red countries and the green countries and all this stuff was going on. But I used to go to the, I used to live in St. Louis and I'd go to the airline lounge, just called the Admiral's Club, and they closed it for a long time. And then they had it open for a little bit because you know how COVID things were closed, they were open, they were closed again. And two of the people, three of the, actually three of the people that were the most senior there uh, decided that um, they, they were going to quit and uh, go do something else. Uh, and they were old enough to get a retirement uh, from American Airlines. So I think the whole thing of closing and opening just caused them, you know, to resign and do something else with their life at that point, which is, you know, kind of sad for me because I had known these people over many, many years. I saw them, you know, in a club every week because I traveled all the time and I know they worked there, but we're still kind of like some friends that I lost because of COVID as well. So now when I go to that lounge, there's nobody there I know anymore. <laughs> so it's, you know, it has a little bit of an impact in a different front as well. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point that isn't talked about as much is the the kind of the customer's point of view and the customer experience that suffered as a result of those lost. Well, I mean, in your case, almost like friends. Yeah. Um, but certainly familiar faces, people have been doing the job long enough that they were really good at it, that kind of aspect of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, you've also written a book, I believe. Would you like to tell us a bit about that? I've written a couple books. Uh, my second one came out late last year, late, mm-hmm. late uh, 2023. My first book came out in 2021. The first book is about, it's called The Smartest Person in the Room. It's about my entrepreneurial journey with my first cybersecurity company. And as a leader, I had to do a lot of reflection on the company, the culture, the vision. And I realized the biggest problem I had with my company, there are lots of problems, but the biggest one I had was I was hiring, hiring people based on their technical skills, not their people skills. And 99% of the problems I had in my business were because my staff lacked emotional intelligence or lacked the people skills. They had the high IQ. They're super rationally intelligent. Uh, and I decided to fix that in my company. And that's what I wrote the book about. Uh, there's seven steps I have in the book. And, and that helped the company. And what I realized, not everybody was on board. So I had to let some people go. And then when I hired people, I flipped the script. I used to hire people pretty much purely based on their technical aptitude and if they had the right certifications and qualifications. But then I decided I'm only going to hire people if they culturally are a good fit. And that's what I looked at first. If they weren't, I did not even bother to look at their technical skills. And I think in my industry, and this is partly why I wrote the book as well, uh, we, we get what we tolerate. I believe we do that in life. Whatever we tolerate, we get more of. And we tolerate in cybersecurity and in other high-tech industries, people that don't have 
emotional intelligence. We sort of created this monster and this monster results in poor collaboration, poor communication, because if I get my significance by being, you know, quote, smarter than you, I'm always going to look for a way my ego is to find a way to be smarter than you. That means talking over your head. That means looking for a way to show you're wrong about something. And that is not conducive to a good client relationship or a good team collaboration. And that's the problem I am attempting to fix with my book and through some of my courses and my talks and other things. Yeah. I mean, that problem of, I I think some technical industries, it, it is particularly challenging because there will be certifications that people just have to have before they're even able to do the job. But I do think there's, there's a point of leverage maybe around get the right sort of personality or the right emotional intelligence, the empathetic skills, that side of things. And then the technical skills, the job skills can be taught. It's almost personality versus skill set, isn't it? But Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it is a difficult one. I think it's something that so many companies, especially in that tech kind of industry, really do struggle with. Because again, you know, as you say, it's, it's easy to look at the tech. It's almost like the tech specs, isn't it? Of the person. (laughs) Well, you have technical people hiring technical people typically too. So they're going to look yeah. at people like them. See, well, <laughs> they, yeah. Yeah. And it becomes self fulfilling then, doesn't it? So, how do you solve that problem then? Tell us a bit more about the seven step. It's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, I believe as a leader, you have to set the culture, which is step one, but then you also have to enforce the culture. So, in, in my book, there's seven steps, which were the result of what worked with my team over you know, several years of training, neuro-linguistic programming, uh, coaching, having people come in and talk about uh, how to have crucial conversations, how to communicate better. Uh, people come in and talk a little bit about human behavior because we all want to be significant in some capacity. So a lot of it's awareness. That's my first step is awareness. And I, I tie the steps in my book to neuro-linguistic programming because I'm dealing with highly technical people. And from an awareness perspective, that's step one, we like to think we're very unpredictable. Humans are like super predictable. We just don't think that. And when I say super predictable, uh, if there's a trigger, we run a program. And And pretty soon we've executed this program. And all of a sudden we realize we're in an argument with somebody. And And if we keep continually do that, from an awareness perspective, we need to have the awareness to say, you know what, this program that I seem to be running over and over and over is not serving me. So maybe next time somebody asks me a question, instead of getting defensive, which is my default behavior, my default program, I can run a different program. So the awareness comes in where if I find myself running that program and getting defensive, as example, I'll do a control C, which means I stop that program. <laughs> And then I run a different program. So maybe get curious and ask a follow-up question so you can understand the other person's point of view rather than get defensive. And then pretty soon, that new program will become the default behavior. It'll become the strongest neural pathway in your brain, and the old one will go away. Uh, And that's the awareness point of view. And I think a lot of us don't understand that we just sort of react and run a program by default. and We keep wondering why things consistently happen to us in a bad way. And that's because we're running a program that's not serving us. And then the the second step, I'll just go over a couple, is really about a growth mindset. And this ties to the first step. A lot of people believe they're just the way they are. That means you have a fixed mindset. That means you believe your brain is hardwired. The scenario I just gave about creating a new neural pathway or new program means you think your brain is not hardwired, that you can change your behavior. You're not just the way you are. Uh, And that's an example of a growth mindset. And I think a lot of people uh, don't um, think of it that way. We just think, well, I'm just the way I am. If you're just the way you are, you're always going to get what you've gotten so far. (laughs) And if that's not where you want to be in life, you might want to adopt a growth mindset. So those are a couple of steps. And I can go through the other ones uh, if if you'd like. 
up to you. <laughs> what do you think? Oh uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 interesting. Uh, there's a couple of things you spot there. I mean, like the definition of insanity, right? Is keep doing the same <laughs> thing and expect a different result. And yet, so many of us fall into that without realizing. Uh, so it's really yeah interesting enlightening point there <laughs> yeah that that's that goes back to that awareness and it, it, it and i'm I, i'm guilty of this too you know sometimes i'll i'll fall in a trap of doing something i'm like why isn't my life changing and i realize i haven't changed so my life is not going to change unless i change I, I believe you're you're limited by your success by who you are and i also believe as a leader of a company if i don't evolve my company is not going to evolve my company is going to be contained to how much I evolve, especially if I'm setting the vision for the company and I'm setting the culture. So I think these things are all tied together. Uh, step three is acknowledgement. As a leader, I think it's important to acknowledge people. We often focus on bad behavior and not the good behavior. And we end up getting more of the bad behavior because what you focus on is what you get more of. An example of this that's I like to talk about there was a study where they had two signs, like by a, a, a wet floor. One sign says, caution, wet floor, don't slip. The second sign says, caution, wet floor, walk carefully. So guess which sign resulted in more people falling? The one that said, don't slip, because you're focused on not slipping. So we, we need to acknowledge the behavior we want more of. And for me, this was a challenge as a leader because I never acknowledged myself. I remember in 2005, I went to the Ironman World Championship for the first time as a spectator. I stood on the finish line. I had a, um, somebody take a picture of me. I told myself, one day I'm going to do this race. In 2015, 10 years later, I crossed the finish line as a participant you know, in the race. I raced the race. And I never took a moment to acknowledge this 10 year journey to get there. I was automatically thinking about what's the next thing I want to accomplish. And I realized after that, that if I couldn't acknowledge myself for something that took me 10 years to get to, I was probably not acknowledging my staff enough as a leader. And that really focused um, me on changing how I led people and looking for opportunities to say something positive about their behavior, not just looking for opportunities to notice when they made a mistake. And I think that's an important thing as a leader. Um, the fourth step is communication. Uh, communication is a, a big topic, but one of the NLP presuppositions is that the meaning of communication is the response you get. So if you consider that, that the meaning of communication is the response you get, if you're not getting the response you want from the person you're communicating with, the ownership shifts back to you to alter how you communicate. Often, we just blame the other person and say, well, they just don't get it. They're too stupid. You know, I wonder why I didn't get the budget. You know, we never like think maybe I should have explained this in a different way. So I did get the budget. Or so they did understand. And this is that's a problem I had in my company. Uh, my staff would say, the clients just don't understand what we're talking about. I'm like, <laughs> they're not in cybersecurity. They're, they're a doctor's office, for instance. We need to articulate it in a way that they do understand it. Otherwise, why are, we, why are I even in business, right? My, my staff, my, my clients need to understand it so they can improve their security. So that, that, was, a, that, that was a big one for me. Uh, and then step five is monotasking. So monotasking is doing one thing at a time. We are so fixated on responding to everyone else's demands, a text message, a Slack message, or whatever, instantaneously, that our brain is always context switching from one thing to the other. And this makes us super busy but not very productive. Not, I would argue not productive at all. Most people are just busy. The whole day goes by. They like take an exhale. Wow, that day's over. They repeat the same thing tomorrow. And they haven't made any progress on the things they really want to make progress on. So I think it's important to take a step back and try to become like the star of your own show versus like the supporting actor and everybody else, which is what you're doing if you're responding to all those demands. And monotasking 
also helps with being present. Like I, I'm, I'm still surprised by how many people go out to dinner and I'll see like a couple sitting there and they're both on their phones. Like how pleasant is that conversation or how, how, how appreciated does the other person feel if they can't even get the time with the person across the table from them? So I, I think it's something we super need to focus on in our, in society today. Everybody's become glued to their phones and I, I don't understand it. Uh, because like if somebody, if I, if I'm in a conversation with someone and they pick up their phone and start like responding to a text message, I just stop talking. Cause it's like, obviously what, what I have to say is not that important. Um, so I don't do that for, for anybody else either. Uh, and all these steps are in my, on my book, obviously the next step is empathy. I think with today, there's a lot of division there's the pro-vacciners, the anti-vacciners, the Republicans, the Democrats, the, the this and the that. And if you see your fellow human is separate from you, it's hard to be empathetic. With me, uh, something that sort of hit hard on this one is a couple years ago, I had blood clots in my left leg and I almost died. And uh, I had six of them. And the doctor came out and, you know, delivered the news. He's like, uh, I had to, you know, I had these tests done. I had to wait in the waiting room. He comes out and says, well, you got blood clots. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? He says, well, it means you can die or, you know, have a stroke at any moment. And I'm like, you know, it's kind of like not good news to hear that. So I'm like freaking out. And uh, I start crying. I'm there by myself. Um, none of my family is around there. None, you know, I was single. And I'm, I'm crying a little bit and freaking out. And, um, he notices that. And what he says is, he's like, oh, don't worry about it. I see this all the time. And it kind of like pissed me off because I'm like, you know, I, I don't see this all the time. This is a first for me. You know, and I realized like zooming out that he was looking at this scenario purely as I'm the doctor. This is the patient. I'm delivering news. I'm looking at through, he was looking at it through his lens versus by lens. And it's hard to be empathetic when you're only seeing things through your perspective. And, and then today, there's so much divide. Like, th these people are this group. These people are this group. It's hard to be empathetic with them if you, if you see that. We need to look at everybody as fellow human beings. You know, there's, we're just humans. And we have a lot of the same challenges. And <clears throat> the last step is Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese word that means continuous and never-ending improvement. Uh, and I think if you adopt the mindset of Kaizen... Uh, it helps with all the other steps. It allows you to realize I'm not going to become a master of emotional intelligence or communication or any of these steps, you know, overnight or monotasking. What's important is I make small changes. And if I take a step in the wrong direction, now I know that's not the right direction. So adopting that philosophy gives you the courage to start because a lot of people Fear that they, they're not going to know how to figure something out very quickly. And the reality is, if we've got these ingrained habits, and this happens a lot with golf. I remember reading about Tiger Woods uh, learning how to, how, to, how to hit the golf ball differently or changes how he held the club. Uh, he actually got worse before he got better because he you know, had to unlearn a way that wasn't getting him to the next level. Uh, and that's part of Kaizen as well. We might get worse at something before we get better, but we have to continue on the path. Uh, and as long as we're enjoying the journey and the incremental improvements, that's what matters. And I had to think about that a lot in business because there's, you know, it's rarely like all of a sudden everything clicks and, you know, all the revenue starts coming in. It's, it's a journey. So those are the seven steps. Wow. Okay. Lots in there for me to comment on. I'll try to remember everything that occurred to me. I'll probably forget some of it, but we'll give it a go. Um, communication, I, I like particularly, um, because it's, it's so important for leadership anyway. But I think the way you talk about it there and in the, and shifting that context and the perspective when you're communicating, I think is an especially powerful lesson for leaders because so many of us, when we are delivering communication as opposed to listening, which should be the majority in my view. It's very easy, isn't it? And technical people, the academics very much fall into this. You speak in your language because you're the one who understands the thing. And so that's what you're going to describe. And, you know, the acronyms creep in, the technical terminology, all this stuff. And the doctor story was another example of that, I think. 
mm-hmm. and you you communicate it in a way that you understand it. And that's a very human thing to do. We all do it, I'm sure, all day, every day. Mm-hmm. But how powerful is it if you can think about communicating in the way that the person receiving it will understand? Or even simply in the method, the way, the, the, me, the means of communication that will best speak to that. Because not everyone is going to take something in when it's delivered verbally. They might listen and understand it at the time and then forget it as soon as they walk out of the room. Some people like to have an email that they can refer back to or a document or a video or something. You know, it's it's recognising that communication isn't always the same every time for every audience. And I think that's something that leaders really need to bear in mind. Um, and then it obviously it links so closely to the piece about empathy as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, you know, everyone is going to experience things slightly differently based on their own situation, their own experiences, their own past and all sorts of other things. And they might just be having a bad day. They might have had a fight with their spouse that morning or something. And it just makes them emoting differently in that situation than they might have yesterday or that they will do tomorrow. And as leaders, again, that is a really difficult thing to navigate, but you've got to you've got to be able to do the communication piece effectively to understand what they're going through and why and what and how and when and all of that before you can then also do the empathy piece effectively. And it all t- yeah, I really like all seven and I can see that sort of thread that weaves them all together. Mm-hmm. And then Kaizen, yeah, continuous improvement, huge fan of that. I really like, and I've mentioned it loads of times, the listeners are probably fed up with me talking about it, but the idea of a lifelong learner Mm-hmm. And any leader, or well, anyone really, but in this context, any leader who said, right, I'm done with learning now. I know everything I need to do to be a leader. I'm cool um, until I retire. You know, the, the second somebody says that or thinks that, in my opinion, they've stopped being a leader. I because agree. if you're not, you know, if you're not always learning, if you're not always open to actually maybe I don't know everything, then, yeah. I mean, what example are you setting to start with? And then secondly, like something will change tomorrow and then everything you know might might not apply anymore. But you've closed the book. You're not going to learn anymore. So tomorrow you become useless. <laughs> yes. Chat GPT or AI replaces you because <laughs> <Well, laughs> it's learning all the time. <laughs> funnily enough, I have done a few experiments with Chat GPT to see if I can get it to lead a team. And it's it's quite good at saying no when it knows it shouldn't do it. So, you know, um, <laughs> Well done, OpenAI, is all I can say to that. Yeah. Anyway, right, rant over, off my soapbox. So let's go back then to the cybersecurity work that you do. What what would you say is the biggest challenge that's facing cybersecurity today? I don't think there's any new challenges. I, I think the challenges have evolved a little bit. So my company, uh, Blue Goat Cyber, our niche, what we focus on is medical device cybersecurity. So there's an average of 14 medical devices connected to a hospital bed. And a lot of those devices are are vulnerable. There's also, with surgery now, we have things like surgical robots where a doctor can remotely perform surgery. And we're migrating to autonomous surgical robots that do the surgery by themselves. So imagine if these things are compromised, you could you know, easily kill somebody. You could damage your spine because some of these robots operate on your spine. Uh, and that's just like the tip of the iceberg. So I think, you know, what, 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 it, what gets, keeps me up at night is the physical aspect of some of these devices with a cyber component. If somebody steals your credit card information, you know, big deal. If somebody steals your health information, big deal. It's all, it's all already been stolen anyway. But if somebody hacks into a medical device, that your grandmother is depending on for her life, like let's say a drug infusion pump, and they increase the flow rate of some drug, it could kill her. So my passion is is helping secure those medical devices. And and a little bit beyond that is, because those are physical things that could have a a, a direct impact. Uh, Beyond that, we have devices, uh, like here, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, we have autonomous driving cars and I take them all the time. But I also think, you know, what if somebody hacks in this car 
cause it to speed up to 120 miles an hour and, you know, run into a light pole and I'm in the car. So I think our world is becoming more dependent with the physical devices that rely on technology. And I think that's really where we need to focus from a cybersecurity perspective. Of course, the other things matter too. Like if I'm a small business, I need to protect my intellectual property. I'm not, I'm not dismissing that, but I'm saying we're just evolving to having some bigger challenges where the impact is much greater uh, to human life. It does sometimes feel, I have to say, like we're we're approaching the point where sci-fi is not so much pie anymore, aren't we? Thinking about the the autonomous car, like have you seen the the Amazon series upload? It's the one where they they when you die, you get uploaded into a virtual environment and live forever. In inverted commas. I don't know if I've seen the Amazon series. I I saw it's on Amazon about that. Maybe it is the Amazon series. Yeah, possibly. It's um, and then you go live in this this virtual yeah. world, but. Based on how much you pay, your virtual yeah, world is better. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it was done by I think it's the same producer or writer as uh, the the US Office. If you ever watched that, everyone's watched. Oh yeah, that. yeah. I, w- I was just watching the Office last night. There you go. Show. Yeah, so it is a comedy. It's not a serious program, but it, it, I mean, it starts off no spoilers. It's in episode one. Exactly that happens. Someone hacks a car and kills someone, and then there's obviously the dystopian aspect of it. You know, the more money you've got, the better your virtual yeah. environment after you die but i mean are, how hackable are these things is the other question um and like <laughs> why would you connect a medical device to a network in the first place if you didn't have to uh, yeah there's big questions yeah, yeah well, people I've... aren't aware of skynet as well <laughs> <laughs> well uh, yeah the matrix is almost here i feel, I feel like yeah. your skynet yeah uh yeah the, the hospital networks are notoriously unsecure so it's extremely important if you have like a surgical robot or an in vitro diagnostics device to make sure they're on a separate isolated network that is secure. But a lot of people don't do that. And that's where these risks come in. As far as the Waymo, the autonomous driving car, Waymo is the brand uh, here. It's ironic because I, I, I tell people I take the autonomous driving car and they're like, oh, I would never do that. That's so dangerous, blah, 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 blah. But that car, I mean, there's a cybersecurity component, but that car has like hundreds of cameras on it. And they don't, the one here doesn't drive exactly to the gate at the airport to drop you off. So I take an Uber every now and then. And my girlfriend and I took an Uber like one one time, right after we took the Waymo the night before and people were complaining about like, we're so crazy. The Uber driver was this 85 year old woman that showed up. Uh, before my girlfriend got fully in the car, the door wasn't shut. She was still getting in. She's the, the the Uber driver started driving off. So it almost like if my if my girlfriend wasn't quick to get in the car, she could have been like ran over by the rear tire. And then the Uber driver got lost, and then, then almost like ran into another car when she tried to park by the gate at the airport. So, you know, we like to think these autonomous driving cars are so dangerous, but I've never had that problem like I have with that Uber driver with any of the autonomous driving you know, ones I've taken. I've taken probably a hundred of them here in Phoenix. So it's something to consider for people. It, it's a good point, isn't it? I mean, everyone gets so up in arms about, oh, I'd never trust my life with a, to a machine and all that sort of thing. But I mean, first of all, we probably are every day. We just don't realize. And, right. and secondly, it's not as if human drivers are like these infallible, no accidents ever happen, like godly <laughs> figures, is it? I mean... <laughs> Just look at the accident rates. Yeah, and the human yeah. driver has two eyes. The, the, the autonomous driving car is like 100. Yeah. Know? But then again, you know, human error can creep in in other ways, like the programming. And, and I thought there's a video going around. I don't know if it's real or if it's been faked, but it's, it's on one of the freeways, I think, in somewhere in the States. And it's three Teslas. And one of them swerves to avoid an accident, which makes the one behind it swerve to avoid an accident and then hit a third one. And then all three of them end up in, in an accident anyway together and no other vehicles are involved so obviously that's doing the rounds on the kind of the technophobe boards quite a lot at the moment but it it's another interesting point about it's only ever going to be as good as the programming and if the human programmer doesn't predict every potential eventuality then there's there's always going to be a point where it falls over yeah it's not just predicting every eventuality because i i've studied this quite a bit with and you're right it, it boils down the the whoever programmed the car but you have to think of scenarios that are a little bit moral dilemmas. Like if I am programming a Tesla and there's a woman with a baby walking and there's a, an old older person over here and I can't avoid hitting either one of them, how does the car make that decision in an accident, for instance? You know, 
that that's that's where the program really comes into play. Like, well, somebody has to make a choice, like which type of human or which, you know, is a baby more important than an older person? If I have to hit somebody like how to, you know, that that's these, these things like are what I wonder about, like who made these decisions and who programmed this technology. And, and a lot of people think these things just operate by themselves, but they don't obviously. And the same thing with AI, AI is, is look, cause I do a lot with AI. It's, it's, it's largely based on whoever is doing the prompting and the prompt engineering, as we say, that's how the AI is going to respond. It just doesn't know how to respond by itself. Somebody is programming it. And if that programmer doesn't have the best intentions, then we have technology that can be doing something nefarious, really, or make decisions that somebody else may not make. Yeah, and I feel like with AI, it, it, that's more of a sort of the, the buzz phrase for the headlines than an actual description of what it is right now, because there's no intellect there. It's not really intelligent. It's just following a program it's following a bit of training it's right it's doing repeatable things that it's been told to do over and over and over again and yes the outcome improves and yes it is learning to a point but it's also not really thinking is it yeah i don't know maybe sci-fi is still further away than we think who knows it's it's interesting and like i do a lot with ai and i i've had ai write like an article and then i'll have another ai check the article to see if it looks like it was AI written. And nine times out of 10, if I don't prompt engineer the AI to, to write the article the right way, it'll say, yeah, it was AI written. So then you have to tell the AI to write the article as a human with perplexity and burstiness. That's how humans, you know, we talk perplexing every now and then and we bursty every now and then. And then we have to tell the AI, well, make it so another AI can't detect it was written by an AI. And I've done the experiments where if you prompt the engineer, the AI to write the article well enough, another AI can't detect it. So it's like, you know, it's kind of this battle of AI versus AI. And in cybersecurity, people always ask me about AI. And that's essentially what it's becoming in cybersecurity too. Because we're like, oh, the good guys, we have these AI-enabled firewalls. We have these AI-enabled anti-spam devices. You know, all this stuff we, we claim. But you know what? The cyber criminals have AI-enabled stuff as well. So they can use that against our AI. So it's not just like we have it. And it beca- it's becoming AI versus AI to a large degree. Yeah, it's almost like a virtual arms race, isn't it? That's a bit concerning. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. Yeah, it's like a virtual <laughs> arms race. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope it stays virtual for a long, long time. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're not I, getting to the Terminator where <laughs> the yeah. AI is taking over. You know? Yeah. I, although I kind of feel like anything that exists in, in TV or, or movies is by default now not going to happen. Um, or at least not in the exact same way, but maybe that's too optimistic. I don't know. We'll, we'll probably never know. I don't know. They're talking about, uh, you know, flying taxis, autonomous flying taxis, uh, you know, and the jets, I think it's the Jetsons. Um, mm-hmm. They had flying cars. So we're, I think we're getting, you know, we'll have those pretty soon. And that was a long time ago, that show. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't really look like cars and taxis, do they? They're basically just drones or helicopters even really yeah. but yeah i know what you mean i know what you mean <laughs> what would be your top tips though for any business leader or manager who's worried about these kind of issues i guess number one realize that even if you're a small business you are a target cyber criminals don't really care where they make the money they just want to make money and typically they have automation that is scanning thousands of businesses in which everyone has a vulnerability, they get in automatically and they start their um, model of how to make money. Basically that could be ransomware or whatever the tactic is. So I, I would, number one, understand that no matter how small you are, no matter what industry you are, you can be a target. And then once you have that awareness, I would do a few main things, which will reduce your footprint from a attacker perspective. Number one, Turn on multi-factor authentication on all your systems, especially your email. Uh, Number two, make sure all your systems are patched and updated. This includes your IoT devices like the television in your conference room, for instance. Everything needs to be patched and updated. includes the applications on your system. So if you have a Windows operating system and you have Adobe Acrobat Reader, that needs to be patched. Your Chrome browser needs to be patched. Because people typically get in 
to a vulnerability. And the other component is your, your staff. Obviously, you want to train your staff to have some awareness about phishing emails. Um, but the reality is people are going to fall for phishing emails no matter how well they're trained. We try to think we're just going to train them and train them and train them and train them and that, ne- that never works. It, it reduces the number of people that fall for phishing scam, but it still doesn't work. So I, I would do that. But then also on the back end, we have to realize cybersecurity is not just technology. There's a process. And one of the biggest scams with small businesses uh, is sort of a phishing email scam or a business email compromise scam where someone says this, they pose as the CEO and they say this vendor needs to be paid ASAP. Uh, and you know, we need to wire them a million dollars to this account. So rather than somebody just doing that, like your accounts payable person, have a procedure in place to make sure that that email actually came from the CEO. Uh, and that that is procedural, not technical. That could be a simple matter of like, okay, I'm going to call the CEO and say, hey, I got a request from you to wire a million dollars to this vendor. Is that really your request? And the CEO uh, can say no or yes, right? But uh, we often, we don't do the simple things. And everything I listed was relatively simple. Um, I'm not saying they're easy to implement, but one of the challenges in cybersecurity is people have made it super complex and it's not complex. Instead of doing a hundred things on a checklist, which is what we often try to do. Some auditor tells us we got to do all 100 things. We can't do 100 things. Do the top five that will give you the biggest return on investment and reduce your risk the most and do those a hundred percent, not all 100, you know, 5% each that doesn't work. And I think that's, you know, the reality of where we are these days, we need to focus on with anything in life. We need to focus on the things that matter the most. So yeah, those are my, my tips. And hopefully uh, those are things that can be implemented fairly easily in an organization. Yeah. I, I think that the training and the awareness thing, um, I'd like to say most, but let's, let's settle for a lot of companies <laughs> are getting a lot better at that than they used to be. Um, yeah. I mean, I think back to some of the cyber training I've done during past employment things. and the, Some of them were a bit sort of rubber stamp. Everyone's done the thing great. And others were a bit more involved. Like we even had a guy who would, he just dotted like USB sticks around the office without telling anyone what they were or who they were for. And they just had a message on them that said, you shouldn't have plugged this in. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think four out of five of them got plugged in. <laughs> and that kind of yeah. practical thing of, yeah, guys, don't do that. Um, it's, it helps learning as well, I think. 100%. And I think that's where, like in, in the US, we had Ronald Reagan once said, uh, trust but verify. So with a training, you know, we trust our people are understanding the training, but we don't really know unless you verify it, which is like the scenario you just went over with the dropping of the thumb drives. And that's where, you know, companies like mine do penetration testing where we do those tests to verify all these defenses you think you have in place, like you've passed your systems, you've trained your users. You don't want the cyber criminal to be the person that first tests your defenses. You want an ally to do that. And that's where someone, you know, like a company can come in and do a penetration test or some social engineering to validate that your training worked. I think that's extremely important. Yeah. I mean, it was certainly an eye opener for us. (laughs) But it's those things, isn't it, where you get caught out like that, that stick in your memory, and you, you'll never do that again. So, yeah, I think that's the that's the benefit to that sort of approach, definitely. Conscious of time, so we better talk a bit more about leadership. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, I could keep talking about cyber stuff for ages because it's really interesting. But um, so is leadership. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the biggest leadership lesson you've learned in your career thus far? There's a lot of them. I think the biggest one I've learned is to to listen to my my gut instinct. Um, I like to say the body because you know you can get a chill in the back of your neck or your your hair could stand up on your arm, but to listen to that. So I try to make decisions with my heart, what my body's telling me, and then my mind. And when I've only used one of those it's always been the wrong decision. So as a leader, uh, I think we need to like pay attention to all three of those because it's too easy to be super compassionate and not want to fire somebody if we're just listening with a heart. But our gut is telling us to do it. 
And then we intellectually rationalize, well, if I train them some more, maybe they'll get better, right? So it's, it's a matter of paying attention. And for me, I've had like this aching pain in my gut for persistent for like a month in the past where I knew I should have got rid of somebody, but then I intellectually rationalized it. And then I, my heart said, Oh, you know, that that's, it's the wrong time. You know, they're not doing too well financially, blah, 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 blah. But it ultimately costed me more pain in my organization because as a leader in the organization, the other people on your team that work for you, are looking for you to, to make the right decision with somebody. And they all probably, they all are thinking this person is not a good fit. Why isn't, you know, Christian doing something about it? Uh, so I think, yeah, just paying attention to how we, all of our senses, not just our intellect, I think is important when making decisions as a leader. I really like that. I think, uh, I mean, the other side of it, you see quite a lot of things about, you know, we, we make data-driven decisions here. We ignore you know, matters of the heart. We don't listen to our gut. It's, it's all about the data. And I think that's going too far the other way. I think, you know, you've, you're right. You've got to have that balance. You've got to consider all of the different factors, the, the head, heart, and the gut, as you call them, which I quite like as well, I have to say. Yeah, I think if you're purely making decisions based on data, I don't think that makes you a leader. I, I would say that makes you a manager. I mean, managers manage based on a system. Leaders have to make some decisions where there may not be a system, there may not be the data. You just have to have the ability to to listen and tune in and make the best decision you can, which is why I'm suggesting your heart, your body, and your mind. You know, those three have to be intertwined. I think the other limitation of data is it doesn't really tell you the reasons behind it. You don't you don't get the context, and yeah. you know you might think you're being objective by doing that, but really you're probably missing half the story which you need to know to make the right decision so 100 percent, yeah okay um so what has been your own best experience of being led one uh scenario that sticks out to me is there was a guy i was on a team doing defense contracting work uh and the team leader was this guy named patrick i was in the uk actually when 9 11 happened And we were working on a a military installation over there, optimizing their environment and securing it. And then, you know, we saw 9-11 happen. And the way he handled that scenario, I thought was a good example of leadership. He, you know, we were working late because we were doing some upgrades to the environment. And so we we saw the, you know, what was going on with 9-11. But instead of like, you know, freaking out, um, he said, look, you know, we have, we have this mission to do here. We have this stuff going on in the, in the U S and obviously it's, it's affecting people. Uh, so let's just call it a night tonight. Uh, you know, we'll go out and have dinner and have a couple of drinks and then tomorrow we'll come back to work, but we'll keep an eye on, on things. You know, it wasn't like he just freaked out and he kind of, he did a really good job balancing uh, what we were trying to accomplish while we were in the UK and what was going on in the US with the team dynamics and the team emotions in a way that wasn't, uh, you know, too focused on one thing. And uh, I just thought, I just thought that was a really good example of leadership because we all felt, you know, and I think that's what's really important is how people feel and how you make them feel as a leader is the most important. We all felt, um, nobody freaked out and we felt like, okay, we're, we're doing the best we can in this scenario. And, and, our team leaders got our got our back, and he's leading us in the right direction. Uh, and I think we forget about that sometimes. As a leader, uh, I believe that life ultimately is a boils down to how we feel on a on a minute basis or a second basis, uh, not a daily basis. It's every minute and every second. And as a leader, if you make someone feel appreciated and understood, and you're empathetic a little bit, uh, that goes a long way versus just treating everybody like a robot. Uh, plus, it helps that communication, as we discussed earlier. If you understand a little bit about what somebody might be going through, uh, you can communicate with them a little bit better as well. And I, that's what Patrick did very well on that uh, that trip. Yes. And I mean, much is said these days about psychological safety and about how that's the leader's responsibility. But I think in situations like that, it's, it's not just psychological safety, is it? It's safety. It's making people feel safe in those extreme times when things like that are happening and you probably everyone's worried about their family and mm-hmm. people that maybe knew in New York and things like this at the time. And just being aware of that and adjusting your leadership. And at the same time, he was probably having very similar experience himself and overcoming right. that 
they look after his people first. I mean, yeah, I agree. It's a great example of leadership. Yeah. So much so I, I wrote about that example of my uh, second book as well. Okay. I have a difficult question for you now. It's the time travel question. So if you could go back in time to the beginning of your career, what advice would you give your younger self? I would tune into what I wanted to do with my life uh, a lot sooner and not and tune out of what society, parents, friends, and everybody else expects of you, you know, academics. Because for me, I think I knew what I wanted to do, like be an entrepreneur, take risk way early on. But I kind of tuned out of myself and tuned in to the rest of society thinking, well, the definition of success is to, you know, get married, get a mortgage, uh, get a car, get the white picket fence, get the dog, get a nine to five job. And, and I did all that. And I thought, because I wasn't, you know, that's what society was expected. And it, it, it killed me. It killed my soul. I remember like driving to the nine to five job once and I, the, the exit on the interstate was coming up and I just felt like driving by the exit and starting my life over. I'm like, what did I get myself into here? So, and I knew that earlier on, I just ignored it. So I think it's important to tune into you and tune out to everything else. And I think that's a hard thing for us to do today uh, because there's so much distraction, so much information, so many quote gurus telling you what to do. But I think innately, we know what to do. We know what, what our purpose is. We know what motivates us. We know what drives us. We know what makes us want to get up in the morning. It's just we need to tune into it and tune out to the rest of it. So that would be the advice. It's good advice. Know thyself is is all well and good, isn't it? But you have to then actually do something about it once you've once you've done that. Well, that's the second. That's the second <laughs> yeah, part, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the important part, I think. Well, <laughs> yes. they're both important, aren't they? But maybe the second bit is the. You got to take part. the action once you know what you need to do or what you want to do. Yeah. Of course, without yeah, action, I'm, it doesn't matter. It's exactly. just a dream. It's just a dream. It's never going to become reality. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And that's where so many of us get stuck, isn't it? I mean, yeah, we, again, it's it's one of those things that probably everyone can relate to because we've all done that. Uh, you know, whether it's, you know, I, I need to pay the mortgage, so I'm going to stay in this job that I hate for 10 years, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about this or that. And it, and it drives you down the wrong path sometimes, and you end up being less happy and probably earning less money in the long run as well. Yeah, yeah. it's a good lesson, definitely. There's that, mo- there's that movie uh, Up in the Air with George Clooney, and there's a scene in that movie where he's firing this guy and he's like, how much do they pay you to give up on your dreams? Because he knew this guy, based on reading his resume, he wanted to be a, a chef. And the guy um, had been in this company forever, but they, you know, they just give you a little bit more money every year and a little bit more the next year. You've got the health benefits and pretty soon you've spent this money. You've bought a bigger house. You've bought a, big, a better car and you never really make it ahead and you get trapped. And I think it's important to, to keep an eye on that. And I, I, a lot of us, fall into that. And and that's okay for some people. If that's really what you want to do. But I think a lot of us are, you know, get in that trap and we don't know how to get out of it. And that's where that Kaizen principle comes into play. I mean, every night, instead of watching two hours of TV, maybe watch one hour, if that's what we do, and spend an hour figuring out a plan to do something else that you want to do, to turn your interest into a reality. Uh, that may be taking a class and maybe savings, figure out how to save some money, figure out how to make a little more money on the side. No, but we have the ability to change our lives. We just largely uh, get so exhausted from our day-to-day jobs that we don't put in the extra effort. And and as an entrepreneur, you know, a lot of people think we have it made or I have it made. And I'm like, look, you know, I traded a nine to five for a five to nine. Basically, I'm working more than I've ever worked, but I don't mind working because I'm building something that I'm passionate about. Uh, which is a little bit different than building somebody else's, you know, dream or working for, you know, a nine to five. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a nine to five, but I think if it's not what you want to do, you need to like find a way out of that before it becomes something that sucks your soul, which I think it does for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Or, I mean, reassess the way you look at it. If the nine to five is just the means to the end, it lets you do that other thing on the side or it pays for your real passion outside of work you know it's yeah it's it's mindset isn't it so much of it and and what's what's healthy versus potentially unhealthy as well in 
Mm-hmm. It can be just as simple as the way that you're looking at something, the way that you think about it. Don't let it be a drain That's on you. That too. Yeah, mind. you could just flip yeah. the mindset and say, you know, this nine to five supports my the lifestyle I want, and uh, I'll, I'll make the best of it because I I get to do all these other things because of it. That's a good way to look at it as well. Yeah. Also, incredibly difficult though, particularly if you're hating your time there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, none of these things are easy answers, unfortunately. But there we go. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Leadership Heroes. If you had to pick one person, and it could be anyone you like, they could be alive, dead, past, present, real, or even fictitious, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership, who would that person be and why? I'm going to pick a fictitious one. I'm going to pick Donna from Suits, the series Suits. And I'm picking Donna. I don't know if, you, if you've seen the series Suits or anyone has. Have, yeah. Donna's not the official leader in the office, but she's the person that holds the office together. In my opinion, she is the leader of the office, but her title later in, later in the seasons, it became, you know, COO. But initially she was the one that, that kept everyone on track and headed in the right direction. And the main reason is some of the things we've been talking about is she paid attention to what was going on with people. And, and worked with that uh, to, to draw out their strengths and, and get them, you know, realigned in the right direction. And she had that skill, which is that emotional intelligence we were talking about and the people skills. And I think that it was demonstrated brilliantly in, in the series. And I also think, because this came up quite a bit, it was her dilemma a little bit. She's like, she realizes she's leading this organization even though her role, I think, was like executive assistant or something. And, and we often think in life that we have to be have a title of a leader to lead something, and that is completely false. I mean, leadership, number one, starts with leading ourselves. You know, there's no title for ourselves unless whatever you want to bestow on yourself, but you need to lead yourself. And you've got a family that could probably need some leadership and people around you. It doesn't have to be a formal title. And and that with with Donna, I think, is important, plus that emotional intelligence component, which I think made her leadership so great in that, in, that sh- in that series. I really like that choice for two reasons. One, it's been a while since we've had a fictitious one. <laughs> um, and secondly, nearly all of the fictional ones we've had in the past have been a Star Trek captain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Quite often the same one, actually, which is interesting, but I'll talk about that elsewhere i'll be honest i haven't seen the whole lot of suits i stopped just after the the guy the main guy left because obviously there's a royal wedding and yeah that kind of upset the series a little bit didn't it oh yeah 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 let's not turn this into a tv critique but yeah i I felt like it lost a little something after he'd gone because that was the whole point of the series was that interaction between him and i want to say harvey harvey yeah yeah um but yeah i mean donna you're right i mean all the way, almost from the start, she was displaying those key leadership behaviours. Like she always knew what was going on with everyone, and sometimes they wrote, wrote that out as though it was sort of a gossip thing. But I think that was a little bit unfair and not at all accurate. It was knowing your people, which has right. to be like one of the most important things of any leader. <laughs> um, 100%, yeah. So yeah, great choice, great and great reasoning as well. I love that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> He's the first person that popped in mind. So, yeah. No, yeah. Well, sometimes that's for a reason, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I try to go with what pops my mind because we often like rationalize, like, well, that's not, that doesn't make any sense. And to try to like come up with the, the right answer, you know, the, the quote right answer. But, yeah, yeah. you know, that probably would have been the Star Trek fictional character. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, with that choice. It's just, no, those um, are good choices, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's been done. Excellent. Well, Kristen, only one thing really left to ask, and that is if any of the listeners want to learn more about you or perhaps get a copy of one or both of your books, where can they go to do so? They can go to my website, uh, christianespinoza.com, uh, to learn more about me. My books are on Amazon and on Audible. Uh, the latest book just came out on Audible not too long ago. And if they are interested in cybersecurity help, they can go to bluegoatcyber.com and find me there as well. Okay. Plenty of options, and I'll 
pop all of those links in the show notes as well so everyone can find it easily all right and that's it thank you again so much for being with us really enjoyed this conversation and um yeah i hope you have a great rest of your day all right awesome yeah thank you david appreciate it thank you christian for your time and conversation today it was great speaking with you listener thank you for being with us again and please do visit the links they're in the show notes to learn more about christian his books and his work and if you've enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about leadership be part of a community of leaders then come and join us at integrity leaders the online leadership community I'd also love to invite you to a free workshop that I'm hosting at 1 p.m. UK time. So if you're listening to this in the future, sorry you've missed it. But if it went well, I might be running it again. So check the website and find out. Anyway, the workshop is called Finding Your Leadership Values. We'll be exploring the concept of leadership itself, its personal significance to you as an individual leader. Because knowing your leadership values and how to apply them with daily behaviours is an excellent place to start when you're a new leader or taking the next step up that ladder. So the aim of this workshop is to help you define what leadership means to you, pick out your own top three values as a leader, and then identify some core behaviours that can guide your practical leadership in the future. You'll find, as usual, the relevant links in the show notes or the episode description down below somewhere or off to the side, depending on where you're listening or viewing. So sign up to that now, and I hope to see you there. And if you can't make the workshop, of course, the podcast will still be carrying on. So join me again for next week's episode for a discussion about resilience and the nuance of running a family business with my next guest, Chrissy Myers. That's all for today, though. I'll talk to you again next week. And until then, be a leader, not a boss.